Well, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, Pastor Michael Jackson. Welcome to the Wednesday night, Cutting It Right Bible Study, another Bible study for your heart and soul. We are here to praise the Lord tonight. We are here to hopefully empower you and encourage you in the things of the Lord. Uh, we are streaming right now on Spreaker.com. That is our podcast platform. Uh, we're streaming live on YouTube, live on Facebook, and live on Periscope slash Twitter. So if you are on Facebook, you can share this page that someone else also may be blessed tonight. If you are watching on Periscope, you can also retweet this so that someone also may be blessed tonight. You can also find all of our podcasts on Spotify, Google Podcasts, iTunes, iHeartRadio, and TuneIn Radio. You can also go to our website at that's the word.org. You can also go to our YouTube channel and subscribe there for all of our podcasts. So we praise the Lord. The Lord is on the move. We are moving forward in the Lord, and we pray that you will join us as we move forward in the things of God as we go forth. And take this word to the world. Amen. That's the goal of That's the Word Ministries. We are taking this word to the world. Amen. So we are going to continue doing this. We bless the Lord tonight. Once again, we are here with a study uh, that will encourage you. And last week as we were here, we were talking about devilish devices. We were talking about the different things that the devil uh, does to try to entrap uh, God's people. We said that Satan has a plan. Uh, we mentioned the fact that uh, we are not to be ignorant of Satan's devices and his plans and that he seeks to devastate our life, our ministry, and our testimony. And we need to do all we can to make sure that we are aware of what the devil is up to. Nowhere in the Bible, as we just said, nowhere in the Bible does it state that we need to be ignorant of these things. We are to know what's going on when it comes to Satan. Now, that does not mean that we have to get addicted and all wrapped up in Satan. No, that's not what it's about. Because when, in the long run, when we look at it, it's all about Jesus. Because Jesus was victorious and remains victorious. We do not war against the devil from a place of defeat. We war against the devil from a place of victory. But we still must keep our guard up. We still must fight. The Bible says that this spiritual warfare that we are in is a fight of faith, a fight of faith. So we need to keep our armor upon ourselves as we fight this war. Now we're going to pray. We're going to get into our study for tonight that the Lord has uh, given to us. And once again, share this page with someone if you're on Facebook and retweet it if you are uh, watching on a Periscope. Uh, we pray that you will do this. Lord, we bless your name. Tonight we thank you, Lord. Uh, that you have allowed us to gather here in your name. And Lord, we pray that your presence might continue to be with us as we uh, go forth in your name. Lord, we know that we're going to be speaking about a very uh, sensitive subject, Lord Jesus, sensitive to the enemy. But Lord, we know that you are able. So Lord, have your way. Bless us together. Draw those who need to hear this word tonight. Draw them to this location on the internet. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. We bless the Lord. Now, tonight we're going to take a, a look. We're going to take a closer look at five, we're going to take a closer look at five colossal, let me just say, five colossal failures of Satan. Five colossal failures of Satan. Uh, Satan has been, uh, Satan has been around for uh, quite a long time, and we are going to take a look at the different ways, uh, the different ways uh, that he has uh, gone about trying uh, trying to destroy uh, the work of God, trying to uh, come against the work of God, and we're going to take a careful, a careful and close look. Uh, we hopefully that we will be able to uh, complete uh, our study for tonight, and whatever we whatever we don't complete, we will uh, continue uh, as we come together uh, on next week, but. We are going to start this study, uh, and we're going to get it underway right now. Uh, if you go to, if you go to the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis, uh, in the book of Genesis, we begin uh, to see, uh, as we said last time, uh, two weeks ago, we begin to see ground zero, where Satan started from, as as far as as far as. Uh, as, far as uh, his uh, war against God's people uh, we see just where he started from uh, but Satan's history of failure Satan's history of failure 
uh, begins not long after the events, after the events of Genesis uh, chapter 3. After we see uh, the Lord in Genesis chapter 3 tells Satan, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. He says, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And we see in chapter 4, we pick up the Genesis story in chapter 4. And here we will begin to see the beginnings of Satan's history of failure. Now you might say, even before we start, you might say, now what is the purpose? What is the purpose of talking about Satan's failures? What, what, what does that do? What is, what is the point? Well, it is necessary. It is necessary that we become aware and that we arm ourselves with the knowledge of the many failures, the many failures uh, of Satan to thwart and undermine and destroy the plan of God. And knowing this and arming ourselves with this knowledge uh, should only empower us and encourage us uh, in with this powerful truth that Jesus is victorious. Jesus is victorious. As we will see, as we come near the end of this study, you, you will see, we will understand that Jesus is absolutely victorious. And even though it's something that you say, well, I know this already, it's something that we always need to be reminded of, that Jesus is victorious. He is absolutely victorious. All right? So in all of Satan, in all of Satan's works, that he has tried to aggravate and frustrate and delay the plan of God. Every single thing that he has attempted has been met with absolute failure. Absolute failure. And once again, knowing that he is a failure and the things that he has tried to do against the Lord should empower us because we know that he cannot do the things that he would want to do. Why are you still here? Why hasn't he been able to keep you down? Why do you still continue uh, to minister through the struggles, through the hard times? Why are you still here? Because Satan cannot do what he wants to do. He would love to destroy you. He would like to make you disappear if he could. But you are in God's hands. You see, the enemy, the devil, Satan, he may, he, he, he may instigate. But God orchestrates and God knows what we can handle. And he will not allow the enemy to take us down. He will not allow the enemy uh, to take us down. So let's go into Genesis chapter 4. We're going to read the first eight verses and then we're going to go back and, and, and do commentary on it. And we're going to talk about Satan's first failure. His first failure. It says, And Adam knew his wife. Genesis chapter 4, uh, verses 1 to 8. And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And again, bear, she bare again his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought forth the fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought up the first things of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance uh, fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with his brother Abel, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against his brother Abel and slew him he rose up against his brother and slew him so you see these are two boys these are two young men as we see that they have grown up in the process of time one is a shepherd one is a farmer two boys grew up in the same house with the same parents given the same food and they were told the same things both of them were very much aware of the story that Adam and Eve more than likely definitely told them concerning the beginning they told them we, we we have to we have to strongly believe that Cain and Abel knew what happened in the garden of Eden and no doubt they were told that God clothed them with skins of animals and that these skins of animals represented 
the fact that God had forgiven them. God had forgiven them. And so we go into this story with the knowledge that they had this knowledge. Now, we see here in the process of time that Cain, Cain brings the fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord. He brings the fruit of his hands, the works of his hands. He brings it. And you would say there's nothing wrong with that. He brings the, the work of his hands, the sweat of his brow. He brings it to God and God should accept it. He should receive it. Abel also brings of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And here's what happens. The Bible says that the Lord had respect unto Abel and unto his offering. But unto Cain and his offering, he had not respect. There was a problem. There was a problem. You see, these two boys represented two lifestyles. Two lifestyles and two lifestyles that still exist today. We read on, we read on that Cain was very angry and he questioned and God questioned him, why are you angry? And he told him, if you do the right thing, strongly implying that he had done the wrong thing, he said, if you do what is right, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, he says, sin is crouching at the door like a lion ready to pounce upon you. He says, sin is crouching at your door, the door of your heart, the door of your life. Unto thee shall be his desire, but you shall rule over him. We read in, we read in the book of Romans chapter 6 and verse number 14 that sin shall not have dominion over us. Sin shall not have dominion over us uh, because we are not under law, but under grace. So we see this, this whole, that, that particular thread carried through throughout scripture. Now, the only way that we can rule over sin or the sin nature is by putting our faith in Christ. Now, Christ was not present there. So what did they do? Put their faith in the promise that was given to them. Put their faith in the word that the Lord had spoken. That's where their faith was. And that was the difference in the two boys. That was the difference in the two boys. This allows us a chance. This allows us a chance to look at what the Bible calls the way of Cain. The way of Cain that we read about in 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 12 and in Jude 11. Here's what it says in Jude 11. Woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain. 1 John 3 and chapter 12 goes on to say, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And why did he slew, slay him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's were righteous and so once again the bible is its own commentary the bible tells us very very carefully very specifically exactly what was going on in genesis it tells us because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous he killed his brother he had done the wrong thing he had not obeyed god you see cain cain was religious he was religious and this particular characteristic fueled the rest of his actions. He was a religious person and this meant that he depended on the works of his hands. Today, many who are steeped into religion, they believe that by the doing of things, it gives them some sort of some sort of measurement with God because they because they do things, because they do attend church. Because they do maybe attend a Bible study. Because maybe they have been baptized. All of these things are these are good things. But once again, it has to be coupled with faith in Christ. Are you born again? There are many people who attend Bible studies who are not born again. There are many people who have gotten baptized without the without the privilege of being saved at all. There are many people in choirs and doing other ministries in the church, and they have never given their heart to Christ. This is religion. They're depending on their works to get them to heaven. The Bible says not by any works of righteousness. We are not saved by works. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us very specifically that we are saved by grace through faith and is not of works. It is the gift of God, not of works, once again, so that no one can boast. So this man Cain was religious. We find also that he had a root of bitterness that he would not put down. He was unrepentant. 
He was unresponsive to God's word when God told him, if you do the right thing, you will be accepted. He did not accept it. He did not accept it. And this is what caused him to be rejected. And once again, we read right here in 1 John 3 and 12 that he was of that wicked one. He was not a, quote, righteous person. That was not him. He was of the wicked one. Once again, the enemy was using, Satan was using Cain to try and destroy his righteous brother. So once again, you see Satan at work, even at this particular time. He is at work in the heart of Cain. No, we're not saying that Cain was possessed. Satan can use individuals without possessing them. If he possesses a person, he has full control. But if he uh, uses them, he, he can use them without the benefit of possessing them. We're talking about evil spirits that come and possess. Now let's look at let's look at Abel. Uh, the fact that Abel was righteous. Remember, his works were righteous. And anytime you see the word righteous describing an individual in the Bible, it means that their faith is in God and his promises. We read about Abraham that he put his faith in what God had spoken and it was counted to him as righteousness. He was born again. Maybe not in the way that you might think. Maybe not in the Nicodemus way. Maybe not in the New Testament way. But Abraham was saved. Because he trusted in the promise of the coming Savior. He trusted in what God had spoken. We, we are saved because we trust in the fact that Jesus came. They trust in the fact that Jesus was coming. Same Jesus, same result. We are saved. So Abraham was a saved man. He was righteous. Just like Abel was righteous. And once again... This particular characteristic characterized the rest of his actions. He goes on. He's obedient. He does what God requires. He brings the animal sacrifice. This is what God requires. You see, we cannot come to God any way we want to. We must not think that we can just come to God and give him any type of worship. It won't work. We must come to God properly. The Bible says that we must worship him in spirit and in truth. So there needs to be a sense of honesty, integrity, and righteousness when we come. No, we're not saying that we are coming perfect, because that's not possible. But we need to come with the right attitude. And, and Cain did not possess that attitude. Abel did, and his offering was received by the Lord. He was reverent, and once again, this led to him being accepted by the Lord. Now, this particular story demonstrates the conflict between religion, which is of the world, and righteousness, which is of God. Now here's, once again, Satan's failure. Satan would try and pit brother against brother, filling Cain with the anger and the bitterness and the hatred and the revenge, leading up to the first murder. If Satan was able, Satan would have them destroy one another. But Abel, Abel, Abel was not that one. And though Abel was righteous, and though he did die a horrible death, Cain was not the promised seed. And we see here Satan's first great failure. He was attempting, he was attempting to destroy God's redemptive plan right from the beginning. Just kill off the first two people. Kill off the first two people ever born from a woman. Kill them off. He was trying to destroy God's redemptive plan. Now let's move on. Let's move on. That's his first, that's his first failure. But there's more. There is more. When you go to the book of Exodus, when we book, look, go to the book of Exodus, chapter 1, chapter 1, uh, verse, verses... Uh, 15 and 16. Exodus chapter 1, <clears throat> verses 15 and 16. Let's go there very quickly. Now here we're going to see in his second failure, Satan is going to attempt to destroy the nation. All right? Satan now is going to attempt to destroy the nation that was going to bring forth the promised seed. Here's what it says 
in Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. And the king spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shepra and the other Pua. And he said, When you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. So once again, do you see what Satan is trying to do? Satan is trying to nip the plan of God in the bud. Satan is trying to cut off the nation that was to bring forth Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus Christ is who he is looking for. He doesn't know it's Jesus Christ. He doesn't know the name. Remember, remember, Satan does not, Satan does not know every exact move or thought or plan of God. He does not. Now, he may have more insight than we do because he operates in the heavenlies. He may definitely have more insight than we do, but he does not know what God is about to do. He does not know when the rapture is going to take place. And there are many things that Satan does not know. Remember, Satan is limited in space and time. Satan is not here and there and everywhere. Satan is in one location at this time. He is in one location. Now, he may give us he may give us the, uh, he, may, he may seem as if he is everywhere. That's only because there are myriads of, of evil spirits that once again operate in the heavenly places. They surround us. And he gives us, Satan gives us the semblance that he is everywhere. No, no, no. His influence is everywhere. But he is not. He does not even know what you are thinking right now. He does not know what is in your heart and in your mind right now. He does not have that ability so he does not know every god's every move thought or plan or action uh but he has always been able to use individuals through his deception which sometimes masquerades as as wisdom for those who are being used it seems like they're doing something great it seems as if they're doing something wise but they are being used as tools by satan once again those being used by him don't even know it now here in the book of Exodus, he uses the reigning Pharaoh of the day. And this man was possibly demon possessed. Once again, we know that an individual does not have to be demon possessed in order uh, to do evil. But scripture states, script, scripture rather states that the hearts of men are evil above all things. Who can know it? That's from, uh, that's from Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9. But listen, in order to murder children, and hundreds, maybe thousands of newborns, I, I, I think that requires uh, the work of Satan really working in somebody. So at this point in time, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they have all come and gone. And Satan injects hostility and insecurity in Pharaoh that these Jews are going to rise up and take over and through this fear and through this insecurity, Satan uses Pharaoh to devise this diabolical plan to annihilate the entire nation of Israel through rigor, through torture, and through death. And they suffered. The ancient uh, Israelites, they suffered. They suffered greatly. They suffered greatly. But he is what happened even though Moses would become as the Bible states the most humble man on earth and he did go on to deliver the people from bondage and prove to be uh, very human at the end if you know the story he did not even enter into the promised land uh, because he was disobedient at the very end even though he had all of these qualities and characteristics that, that he did this man Moses was not the promised seed. He was not the promised seed. And the nation would continue to grow by leaps and bounds. It was, it was the ancient church father, Tertullian, uh, who said that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. What does that mean? The more you try to drive Christianity underground, the more you try to shut off the voice of the Lord in the earth, the more you try to Keep down the word of God, the more it rises, the more it rises.
the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Anytime in the Bible, uh, in the especially in the New Testament, anytime uh, that there was a, uh, anytime that there were there was persecution, they would spread out and they would carry the word with them. So persecution, as bad as it was and bad as it might have been, persecution served a purpose in spreading the gospel. Once again, Satan. Another colossal failure for Satan. You see, Moses was the lawgiver. He was the lawgiver. And God would use the law as a stopgap measure uh, to allow the children of Israel to remain in relation with him. But he was the lawgiver. He was not the grace giver. So once again, Satan failed. Satan failed. He was looking for Jesus. And now he's trying to destroy the nation that would bring forth Jesus. And he fails again. The nation continues to grow. The nation continues to widen. Nothing can stop the plan of God. That's Satan's failure. Number two. Number two. Now we see we are going to enter into New Testament territory. We're going to go into New Testament territory. We're going to go into the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew chapter number two. And here we're going to see Satan's attempt to destroy the seed. Now we, we're going to see that Satan believes now that he is zeroing in. Satan believes that he is getting closer. And so here's what we read from Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 and verse 16. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be thou there until I bring the word. Why? It says, For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. That young child is Jesus. Jesus is now on the scene. Satan was not able to prevent him from being born. He was not uh, able to cause him to, to, to stop the nation that would bring Jesus forth. Verse number 16 says, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and went and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coast thereof from two years old and under according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Once again, Satan is at work. Satan is at work in the hearts of men. Now, Satan, <laughs> Satan did not have to push too hard to get this man, Herod, to do uh, what he did. History, history tells us that this man, Herod, was guilty of many, many brutal acts. Uh, namely, the killing of one of his five wives. And he had already killed three, count them, three of his ten sons. And so once again, Satan did not have to push too hard to get this man to do what he did. So once again, in an effort to track down the baby Jesus... This man, Herod, orders the massacre of hundreds and probably thousands of children from two years old and under. Now, this particular event uh, traditionally has been called the slaughter of the innocents. The slaughter of the innocents, which actually had been prophesied several hundred years earlier, approximately 700 uh, years uh, earlier by the prophet Jeremiah. But even through all of this, even through all of this, once again, God takes care of his people. God takes care of his people. Once again, Satan is thwarted. God protects his own. God instructs Joseph to take his family into Egypt until it is safe to return. Look at God. Look at God. And once again, we need to, we need to be encouraged by these failures of Satan. Once again, Satan is out. Once again, once you step into the realm of of the kingdom of light once you step into salvation once you are born again you enter into spiritual warfare ladies and gentlemen you enter in but you do not enter in alone we have the spirit of God within us we have the word of God to help us and we have our faith 
anchored. Above all, we have our faith our faith anchored in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a fight of faith. The enemy wants you to remove your faith from Christ and put it somewhere else. Wherever else. That's what he wants uh, to do. That's what he desires to do. But this thing called spiritual warfare, the fact that Satan has failed every time he's tried to uh, thwart the plan of God makes him all the more dangerous. All the more dangerous. He Listen, Satan, we serve, serve. We have a relentless enemy. He is relentless. Understand, there is no, let me use this, this phrase, there is no quit in him. He is not going to stop. He is not going to give up. He is not going to be backed up. He is not going to become depressed and say, I can't do it. I'm, he's not going to become frustrated. No, he is going to continue. He is going to continue to breathe down your back. He is going to continue to knock on your door. He is going to continue to crouch like a lion to spring upon you. But the Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are not carnal. But our weapons are mighty uh, to, mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. That's what we must remember. Our faith must lie squarely in Christ and his victory on the cross. That's what needs to happen. So we see Satan's third failure. He failed at trying to destroy the seed. The seed was planted. The seed was now born and he missed it. Jesus is on the scene now. Watch out. Watch out. Well, now we know, once again, there's a passage of time. And we see Satan's fourth attempt. The fourth attempt of Satan. Now, he is going to try and pollute. Pollute the sacrifice. You said, now what do you mean by he's going to pollute the sacrifice? When you read through Luke chapter 4 verses 1 to 12, we read about the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. The temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. And we're not going to go through uh, his temptation. Uh, we're, not, we're not even going to read uh, from Luke chapter 4 uh, verses uh, 1 to 12. We understand that Jesus was tempted and Satan brought up before Jesus three separate temptations. Three separate temptations. These separate temptations that Jesus brought up before Jesus, that Satan brought up before Jesus. Uh, these 40 days, Jesus was tempted through the lust of the flesh. Jesus was tempted with the lust of the eyes. And Jesus was tempted with the pride of life. The lust of the flesh. He tells Jesus, he tells Jesus to turn these stones into bread. And Jesus, of course, tells him that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. That's the lust of the flesh. Then uh, he, Satan decides that he is going to tempt them through the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes. He tells him that I will give you all of these things if you would just bow down and worship me. And Jesus tells him, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Finally, uh, he, he tempts him with the pride of life. He tells him to jump down from the pinnacle of the temple. You're the Lord. You're Jesus. If you're the Son of God, jump down. He will give his angels charge over thee. Once again, once again, Jesus turns around and tells him that you shall not put the Lord to a foolish test. He was trying to incite Jesus with the pride of who he was, if he was who he said he was. And so these three ways Jesus was tempted. See, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all points, just as we are yet without sin. Keep that in mind. Without sin. That's from Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 15. Jesus did not sin. Listen, every temptation or sin that you have ever been ever had to deal with falls into one of those categories that we just mentioned you've either been tempted uh through the lust of the flesh through the lust of the eyes or the pride of life okay all of us that's
the three categories that we are tempted in. We see two examples of this in the Bible, at least two examples of this in the Bible. We see Eve. We see Eve from Genesis chapter uh, 3 and verse number 6. Let's, let's go there. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3 and verse uh, number 6. And let's listen to Eve as she explains why she did what she did. Genesis 3 and 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that's the, that's the lust of the eyes, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desired to make one wise, pride of life, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So once again, she was tempted. She was tempted through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It was food to make one. It was food that was good to eat. That's the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. It was pleasant to the eyes, and the pride of life, it would make her wise. That's how we all are tempted. Second example we find in the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 7. Uh, there's a sad story there about a man named Achan uh, who stole some things that he should not have stolen and hid them in his tent. And it caused the children of Israel to lose a battle at a little town called Ai. But the Lord rooted him out. The Lord rooted him out. And Joshua placed his hand upon him and wanted to know why he stole what he stole. And we read in Joshua chapter 7 and verse number 21, the words of Achan. He says, when I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold and 50 shekels weight and I coveted them and took them and behold they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it once again it was the, the, the lust of the eyes here the lust of the eyes he saw something that he wanted he coveted it he took it and it caused the Israelites a battle and it cost him and his family's lives not just him. You see, you see, our sin does not always just affect ourselves. See, that's the lie that Satan gives us. That don't worry, nobody is going to get hurt. Don't worry. Uh, it's just between you and God, or just between you. Nobody will ever find out. No, 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 no. Sin, sin does in the long run. Sin can and many times does have ramifications that will reverberate. So that's why, once again, the devil is a liar. If he speaks, he speaks of his own because he is a liar and the father of it. Okay, now, when we see Jesus being tempted in the wilderness, this is Satan's attempt to get Jesus to compromise the will of God. To compromise the will of God. To compromise his ministry. Listen, Satan's success would have would have nullified the sacrifice. Once again, he wanted to pollute the sacrifice. Get Jesus to sin. If he could get Jesus to sin, wow. He would no longer have been perfect. Now, let me ask you a question before we move on. What if, what if Jesus, what if rather Jesus had sinned right there on the spot? What if Jesus, in some form or fashion, would have sinned in the wilderness during those 40 days? Or any time during his ministry, what if Jesus would have sinned? It would have meant that he would no longer have been the perfect sacrifice. And for him to come and die for our sins, because this is the reason why Jesus came. Why did Jesus come? While he was here, he did good works. He healed people. He, he did many good works. The book of John says he did so many works that if all the works that Jesus did would be put in a book, if there, are no, there are no amount of books in the world that could contain all the things that Jesus did while he was here. But if he would have sinned, he would no longer have been the perfect sacrifice. Jesus came to die. Yes, Jesus came to die. Why? Because he loved. He loved us. And we needed a perfect sacrifice. And had he sinned, 
And we're not going to discuss whether or not it was whether he was able to sin. Had he sinned, he would not have been the perfect sacrifice. He would not have been the perfect sacrifice. So once again, we know the story. Jesus, he went on, and Satan failed to get Jesus to sin in the wilderness. Satan's failure number four. Now let me just say here that when Satan wants to get something done, when Satan himself wants to get something done, something important, he gets on the job himself. We see in the Old Testament, we see in the book, one of the books of Chronicles, we see Satan, we see Satan rising up. The Bible says Satan rose up against David to number the people of Israel. He understood that there was a connection between uh, the Lord and David. I'm sure that uh, Satan did not know the full connection that David had. That it was, uh, if you get prophetic, you're talking about the throne of Israel. David would sit on the throne. I don't know what Satan was thinking, but Satan wanted David down. And Satan comes and tempts David to number Israel, and he does. And there were consequences for what David did. But it was Satan who rose up against David to tempt him. Satan himself. It was Satan himself that inflicted Job. I don't know what I don't know what Satan was thinking about Job. Whether he would had some sort of connection uh, to the promised seed. I don't know. The Bible obviously doesn't say all of that in the book of Job. But Satan rises up himself against this man, Job. We see. Jesus, we see Jesus himself, the Bible says that Jesus had 12 disciples and Jesus himself said of his disciples have I not chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil this has been dis disputed many times but many people say that Judas uh, uh, was born again and he lost his salvation well I'm not a part of that camp I believe that uh, Saint, uh, Judas was never a child of God, that he was never born again because Jesus says, one of you is a devil. No one who is a righteous person, no one who is born again, no one that is walking with the Lord is a devil. No. Jesus said that for a purpose. Because his life was open. His life was open. And we read, when they are sitting there at the table, uh, as, they, as they are sitting uh, uh, during the Last Supper, we see the Bible says that Satan, Satan himself, not not the evil spirits, not the demons that we see throughout the, uh, the the ministry of Jesus. No, 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 no. It was Satan himself that entered in to this man Judas and caused him and helped him along to do what he did. Satan entered into him. That the Bible says Satan entered into him. So we must be very, very uh, mindful. We must be very mindful. When Satan wants something done, he does it himself. Now, we use we use the term Satan all the time. We say Satan, we say the enemy, we say the devil. Listen, you and I, you and I have more than likely, more than likely, have never, ever, ever dealt with Satan himself. We use, once again, we use his name to identify all the evil that surrounds us. We use his name to identify evil spirits and demons and all sorts of wicked things. But one-on-one, -on -one, you have never, I have never, more than likely experienced Satan. Evil spirits, demons, yes. Highly possible, but not Satan himself. We, 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 are, not, <laughs> we are not that important for him. That's, that's for other people other people in the world who occupy uh, higher positions than we do I'm quite sure I'm quite sure so Satan's failure number four he fails to get he fails to pollute the sacrifice he does not get to see Jesus sin he does not get to see Jesus sin finally finally we see in the book of Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 40 Satan's final attempt That we're going to talk about here Satan's final attempt uh, To uh, spoil 
the plan of God. Here in Matthew chapter 27, a very simple verse, a very short overlooked verse, but here's what it says. In chapter uh, Matthew, chapter number 27, let's go there. Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 40. Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 40. Here's what it says. And saying, you who will destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you be the son of God, come down from the cross. If you be the son of God, come down from the cross. What would have happened if Jesus would have come down from the cross? What would have happened? No one would ever be saved. Once again, he, Satan was trying to abort the sacrifice for sin. Jesus was. Jesus would become the sacrifice for sin. And he was trying to get Jesus through these people that were standing and watching and wagging their head and tisking. He was trying to, through these individuals, get Jesus to abort the plan of God. Now let's be very careful. Let's look at this word abort. Let's look at this what this word abort mean. The word abort means to bring to a premature end. It means to terminate or discontinue. This is what Satan was trying to do. He was trying to get Jesus to bring the redemptive plan to a screeching halt that Jesus would say, no, I'm not doing this. No, I, I can't. He was trying to get Jesus to abort the plan of God. To abort the plan of God. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Once again, Satan uses these individuals to try and plant seeds of helplessness and hopelessness in Christ. But we know how the story goes. We know how the story goes. Satan, Satan would be thwarted once again. And Jesus Christ would go on to victory through his death. Speaking before he died, it is finished. It is finished. I, I wonder if we really, really understand the gravity, the weight, the power behind those words. It is finished. What did it mean when Jesus said it is finished? And what does it mean? The fact that he, the fact that he is, that Satan was brought to a complete failure these five times throughout biblical history. When Jesus says it is finished, it's over. Everything he's tried to do to stop this point from happening, it's over. There's nothing else that Satan can do. When Jesus said it is finished, it meant that the debt of sin was paid. The debt of sin was paid. When Jesus said it is finished, it meant all the types and all the symbolisms of the Old Testament, all the feasts, they were fulfilled. They were fulfilled. It means in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, let me go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 11. It says, and such were some of you. Here's what it means when Jesus said it is finished. But you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. That's what it is finished meant. It is finished made that possible. It is finished made our washing, our sanctification, our justification, and our future glorification possible. When Jesus said, it is finished. Oh yes. When Jesus said it is finished, that was that was Satan's death blow. Now you could say his death blow was when, when is when the Lord told him in Genesis three chapter fifteen, uh, uh, he shall bruise your head. That was it. Once Jesus spoke it, it was going to happen. And here is the moment in time that his uh, head was bruised when he said it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. He gave his spirit away. He died. That's it. Satan defeated, done, over. You tried, you lost, you failed. No victory, no victory. Colossians chapter number two explains it so very nobly. Colossians chapter two 
starting in verse number 13, it says, And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses. That's what it is finished meant, that all of our trespasses were forgiven. It goes on in verse number 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. This is talking about the law. This is talking about the law of Moses that was God's standard of righteousness before Christ that we could never reach. No one could keep the law. It goes on in verse number 14, which was contrary to us. What does that mean? The law was against us. The law was against us simply because we are unable to keep its precepts. We cannot do it. We cannot. It goes on and took it out of the way. Jesus' death on the cross took the law out of the way and the penalty for not keeping the law took it out of the way. What did he do? He nailed it to the cross. No more need to take the feasts of Israel. No more need to operate under Old Testament policies and covenants. Jesus fulfilled them all when he says, it is finished. Verse number 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers. What does that mean? It means that Jesus' death on the cross snatched, snatched, literally snatched Satan's power from him. I know he exercises he exercises power over those who do not know him. He does have power. God has given him a modicum of power, especially those who don't know the Lord. But we who know the Lord, you're born again tonight. Satan has no power over you. He has no power over me. Now this does not mean, this does not mean that we are sinlessly perfect. You are going to sin. The sin nature still is present in you. He will still tempt and there are times when we still will fall. But Satan has no power over us. We are in the Lord. Christ is in us. And we are in Christ. He has spoiled principalities and power. Uh, and made a show of them openly. He made a show of them openly. This thing, this the death of Christ happened in front of the entire universe. This thing, as we said in the book of Acts, this act was not done in a corner. It was not done in a corner. And when he made a show of them openly, he triumphed over them in it. The triumph is complete and it was all done for us so that we can walk in the power and victory of the cross. That's what it's all about, ladies and gentlemen. That's why, that's why spiritual warfare will continue to be a fight of faith. But we fight from a place of victory. Victory. So we got to bless the Lord. Satan is a failure. A failure. But once again, it makes him all the more dangerous. He prowls around. He walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But we don't need to fear him. We do not need to fear him. Stand. Having done all, stand. Keep your faith anchored, locked, securely in Christ and his victory that happened on the cross. That's the place. That's the place that Satan cannot touch. That's the place that Satan cannot deal with. And once your faith is there, faith is there, it makes you all the more difficult to reach by Satan. Once again, we're not talking about sinless perfection. Satan will continue to knock. We said that Satan is relentless. He is relentless. He will not stop. But you must not stop keeping your faith in Christ and Christ alone. Amen. Lord, I pray you might bless us tonight, Lord Jesus. Lord, we know that these words tonight uh, stick in the hide of our common enemy Satan he does not he does not appreciate being exposed and Lord so Lord we pray uh, that you will bless those who have come under the sound of this word tonight Lord Jesus protect them watch over them Lord Jesus because now they have been armed uh, uh, with certain knowledge that can help them to uh, stand in the evil day that with their faith continually in Christ and what you have done for us at the cross Lord Jesus Lord we know that we will be able to stand Lord, have your way as we continue to, to trust in you and place our faith in you. Lord, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.
We bless the Lord tonight. We thank him once again for being here. Uh, we thank him for his word. Uh, we pray that you've been blessed tonight. Uh, if you'd like to hear this particular study again, you can go to Spreaker.com. That is our podcast platform. Shout out to those who do listen in on Spreaker.com from across the United States and, yes, around the world. We thank the Lord for you. Uh, we thank for those who have subscribed to our channel on YouTube. Uh, we're there. Just type in That's the Word Ministries or Pat, uh, Pastor Michael J. That'll bring you right to our uh, YouTube channel and you can subscribe and you can get all of our uh, podcasts. You'll be notified when we do uh, upload uh, anything, which is quite often. Uh, you can also go and follow us on our Facebook page, either my personal Facebook page or the That's the Word Ministries Facebook page. Um, you can also go to Periscope or tweet or you can tweet us at RevMJ, at RevMJ. And you can also catch all of our podcasts on Spotify, Google Podcasts, iTunes, iHeartRadio, and TuneIn Radio. Amen? And any major podcast catcher, uh, you will find our podcast there. Amen? So we bless the Lord. We thank Him for this lesson tonight. Uh, we thank Him for His Word. We thank Him for what He is doing. Tell someone, let someone know that the Cutting It Right Bible Study is on the air live and in color every uh, Wednesday night at 8.30 across uh, several internet platforms including Spreaker, YouTube, Facebook and Periscope. So we bless the Lord. We thank Him for what He is doing. Stand firm in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Amen. So we bless the Lord tonight. We thank you for being with us and don't forget tomorrow night we'll be sitting in for our brother Clarence Thomas uh, in the Bible Study Club. Uh, we'll be talking about this great salvation. This great salvation. You can go to the Bible. Uh, you can go to the Bible Study Club uh, page, uh, or you can go to my page, and it'll give you more information about how you can join us tomorrow night on Facebook or on Zoom. We pray that you'll be able to join us tomorrow night for a great time of study in the Word of God. Amen. So we bless the Lord. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. I'm Pastor Michael Jakes. May God bless you. <laughs>